Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Roderick Flood. I'm the provost of Gresham College, and uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you and the speakers this afternoon to this seminar on what makes a good professional. Um, for those of you who haven't been to Gresham before or don't know anything about us, let me just say a few words. We've been providing uh, free public lectures in the City of London according to the bequest of Sir Thomas Gresham over there uh, since 1597. Sir Thomas was a mercer, um, an alderman of the city and a and royal agent for a considerable period in Antwerp in the middle of the 16th century, a very astute man who made a great deal of money and um, among other things was the founder of the Royal Exchange as well as of Gresham College. Um, he left his money uh, to the Mercer's Company in the City of London to provide free public lectures and as I say that's what we've been doing ever since and nowadays we organise about 150 events each year, all of which take place either in, or almost all of which take place either here or now as audiences have got bigger and bigger in the Museum of London in the lecture theatre there. And today's is no exception in having a, a good audience, an audience of, which will probably uh, add to the average of about 150 a year for each event. Um, but the really big audience is across the world because for the last few years we've been putting all the lectures, including today's, on the internet, on the web, and um, we expect there to be about 1.5 million downloads, not just hits, but downloads of lectures uh, during the course of the year. And do look out for the new Gresham app for smartphones and tablets, which will be launched in the course of the next month or so, um, and which we expect confidently will greatly increase again the um, number of lectures that uh, are downloaded and listened to or read of different, media, different forms of media which you can use to access them. But we do certainly hope that you're, uh, having had the taste of today, you'll come back to the physical um, presence of the lecture of, of Gresham lectures, not just on this kind of topic, but on astronomy or music um, uh, on another occasion. Now, the um, uh, program is here, um, and I'm doing this for Michael. Um, the, that is to, to talk about the growth and development of the professions. Obviously, uh, in a very short time, there are whole books, obviously, on the growth of the professions, but I will try and summarise and also perhaps make some uh, semi-provocative remarks about the current situation of the professions. And I'm happy to do this because I'm an economic historian by trade, and I believe very strongly that the history of our economic institutions, and I would count professions as one of those, is very important in understanding both their work um, and their status in, within our society. And one of the interesting things on a comparative basis is that the professions have different uh, status in different uh, parts of the world. So um, again, reflecting their development. The concept of a professional is essentially, is at least in historical terms or by historians' terms, relatively recent, the creation of the last 150 years. There were, of course, the learn, so-called learned professions of the church, law and medicine from much earlier periods, but the late 19th century saw the emergence of a much wider range of professions um, many of our institutions were actually invented in the late 19th century or the middle of the 19th century um, and uh, uh, the professions can take their place among those and football and um, a whole range of other things. Um, so in the late 19th century the professions developed um, 
based on expertise validated by peers. This is unusual in comparative terms because in other countries, uh, Germany or the United States, to take the example of our two major economic competitors, um, formal training uh, by universities or similar bodies uh, was always at the base of the development of the professions. But in this country, it came from um, the uh, actions of individuals within particular areas of expertise, um, based to a large extent actually on what one could call an apprenticeship model, um, by which people learnt their trade through working with um, the professional, the older professional. So at a time when the economy was shedding apprenticeship uh, in manufacturing industry, it was developing it in uh, areas which we would now call the professional services. It's only later that the universities and other bodies, similar bodies, become involved in awarding on behalf of the um, professional associations their qualifications. And this muddled picture um, continued through the 20th century and indeed in a sense continued today with different legal status, different forms of regulation, different forms of um, association for different uh, body, uh, different groups of people whom we would describe as the professions. Some sought, most of them sought to achieve greater status for their professions and there was a particular wish to achieve the royal title in the royal word in their title or the status of a royal charter. And in return, most assumed the responsibility for regulating the standards and validating the competence of their members. It's important, of course, to remember that for most of the earlier growth of the professions, they were self-employed people. The concept of professionals as employed people employed by possibly non-professionals is a very recent development. Now in return for this, of course, professions came to enjoy some degree of monopoly power and they were sometimes described for that reason as a conspiracy against the public. They could use that monopoly power to set fees and charges, in some cases to require that only registered members could practice, and that's underpinned in the case of some of the medical professions, for example, uh, and the legal professions by the law. And they counter, they sought to counter the accusation that they were monopolies and conspiracies against the public by emphasizing the fact that they, their duty was to act on behalf of clients rather than themselves. Now that model of self-regulation, sometimes underpinned by statute, but essentially a self-regulatory system, uh, lasted for about 100 years and was gradually extended to a whole range of bodies. And therefore you got a widening, a substantial widening of the definition of the professionals, far wider than the original uh, legal, uh, the original learned professions, of course, but widening over the years. Some were given statutory powers of regulation, although usually self-regulation, the General Medical Council, the Bar Council, the Law Society, but most weren't. And there, is, there are, oddly, a number of professions for which there still is no regulatory body. There is no regulatory body for university teachers, for example. Um, but in most cases, accountants, um, a wide range of disciplines, uh, there is such a body, policing the activities of members to a greater or lesser extent and reserving the ultimate sanction of expulsion for uh, cases, rare cases of extreme misconduct. Even in cases where there isn't a statutory monopoly, that's important because, take ex accountancy as an example, it's in practice necessary to be a member of one of the accountancy associations in order to get work, at least from reputable clients. So the general requirement to be of what, is, what it is to be a professional is that the members of those professions put the interests of their 
patients or clients before themselves. They are in a sense subcontracted by society to represent the public good in a particular area and to put the public good above personal gain. And this distinguishes them from people in other occupations in general who aren't seen and haven't been seen as being bound by such standards. Because of those standards, clients were expected to trust their judgment and ability to good, do a good job. And that judgment and that, that ability was validated by their training, augmented by the continuing professional development, which of course is an even more recent phenomenon. It's only really in the 1980s and 1990s that professions started to require people to keep up to date, um, partly stimulated by the rapid increase of knowledge in various fields and by the impact of, in particular, uh, the computer, which made a big difference even to, uh, to, to many of the professions. I think the oddity of the past 20 years in relation to this historical development is about not so much the work of the professions, but about the regard with which professions are, um, uh, are seen by the rest of the community. Increasingly, professionals aren't trusted. Their activities are increasingly regulated by external bodies. Self-regulation has uh, achieved a bad name. So that the entire basis on which the professions were established in the late 19th century and existed through most of the 20th century has, in a sense, been cut away. The expertise is no longer valued or it's questioned and uh, the activities of professionals are no longer trusted. Now, why has this happened? One answer which is often given is a better educated public. In other words, people are in a better position to um, judge whether the advice that they're getting is uh, sensible and correct. If they're dubious about it, there are millions of ways of checking through the internet and on the basis of their own increased educational uh, attainments, whether the advice that they're getting is correct. So that whereas in past decades, past centuries, professionals could trade on the fact that the client really didn't know nearly as much as they did, that's no longer so. But in a sense, that's not really the question. The question is why should clients, uh, all of us, want to question uh, the professionals who have had the expertise, have had the um, education to uh, take part in their, those activities. Why do people no longer trust the professional? There's quite a large uh, literature on this topic, um, of which perhaps the most distinguished uh, contribution was that of Lady O'Neill, Honora O'Neill, a Cambridge philosopher who uh, gave the wreath lectures on this subject. Um, and she noted, and other commentators have noted, that essentially this breakdown of trust occurs from the 1980s onwards. And I think it can be directly attributed in, I'm afraid, the week after uh, Lady Thatcher's funeral to the um, what has, can loosely be described as Thatcherism. The attack on the professions, on expertise, on teachers, on doctors and so on, as a producer interest, complacent, self-concerned, repeating the uh, argument that it was a conspiracy against the public. But I think the strength of that argument, in fact, came from a model of human behavior which uh, denied professionalism, a model of human behavior which based, was based on the view that 
our primary motivation is that of self-interest. Individualism and self-interest is deeply antithetical to the concept of individuals acting in the public good. And therefore those who espouse this particular uh, model of human behavior uh, interpret the behavior of professionalism, professionals and their claim to expertise as self-interested and designed to maximize their own welfare at the expense of others. It's paradoxical that self-interested behavior is regarded as the wellspring of economic progress in the private sphere, but similarly criticized as inappropriate in the public sphere. But politicians have never been logical. What the result of this has, I think, been the breakdown in trust that I referred to. The view that doctors, lawyers, academics, accountants, etc., only act to maximize their own interests and that they therefore have to be restrained, inspected, constrained by regulatory bodies made up predominantly of lay people who, by definition, aren't part of the conspiracy. And this continues, of course. Um, politicians seem to be convinced that in many areas of public life, uh, monetary incentives are what matter. They talk about public service, but simultaneously insist, as Michael Gove, for example, is doing at the moment in the educational field, that employers must introduce performance-related pay as a primary tool of management. Uh, essentially arguing that, that monetary incentives are what um, determines the efficiency and dedication of teachers. This is despite the evidence in the private as well as the public sector that performance-related pay in general doesn't work because people have more complex motives than money, which include the desire to do a good job and to be respected by their peers, which brings us back to the, the peer character of professionalism, which I think is an important aspect of it. Now, we can, and we can discuss all this later on, but it seems to me that all these effect, attacks on the concept and nature of professionalism and the emphasis that we only act on the basis of self-interest have led to a crisis in the professions. They've been suffering from self-doubt as well as being mistrusted by their clients and the public at large. And it's legitimized behavior, unfortunately, which was previously regarded as unprofessional devising complex tax avoidance schemes, having private financial interests in private providers in the health service while commissioning um, uh, such services, or demanding and securing high salaries and incomes from fees on the basis of comparators in the private sector, were all absent from professionalism. And I don't think this is simply a kind of golden age view uh, in 50 or 100 years ago. Now, not all of these developments are negative. Some are positive. For example, the greater knowledge and understanding of the work of professions and their underlying knowledge base. I think it's a good thing that it's possible to challenge your doctor or your lawyer by going on the internet because it keeps them on their toes, keeps them up to date, uh, and that's fine, that's part of a, a, a developed and uh, sensible client um, relationship. But other aspects are negative, particularly the view that professionals are so self-interested as to bias the advice that they give. Uh, I think it goes along, much of that view, with the depreciation of expertise De uh, arguing that expertise has no longer any value, and by contrast, arguing that all opinions are of equal value, the besetting sin of the Twitter generation. Now, what can we do about this? I, we may discuss this for the rest of the afternoon. Um, I think it's probably impossible to turn the clock back. You can't retrieve trust in the short run, um, by certainly not by simply saying that it ought to be there. 
But I think it really means that professionals have to continue to emphasize and to demonstrate through their behavior their public responsibility and the ethical basis of their activities. It means that professional bodies have to resist the temptation to act as trade unions for their members. Of course, they can publicize the, the great uh, uh, glories of being an accountant or an actuary or a doctor or an academic, but the emphasis should be on the service that those professions provide to the public and to individual clients. As part of emphasizing, which I think professionals should also do, that we all have a responsibility for our fellow citizens to abide by the spirit as well as the letter of the law and to behave in an ethically and uh, responsible manner. And it's those characteristics of being a good citizen and an expert citizen which seem to me to sum up what it is to be a good professional. And I look forward to hearing whether you agree with me. Thank you.